This morning I'd like to do something we often do, we don't do it every week, but a kind of a Bible study line on line. King Solomon was the wisest man that ever breathed on the earth with the exception of our Lord Jesus. When he was young, he wrote the Canticles, the Canum Cantorum in the Latin, which is Song of Solomon. And my wife and I have taught Song of Solomon, the entire eight chapters across this nation and, and other nations too, but primarily the United States. We did 250 conferences based on the Song of Solomon. Thousands and thousands of couples heard it, and we were applying the Song of Solomon specifically to marriage, because in the Hebrew, kala, which is what Solomon used, meant spouse. So it was spousal love that was being postulated there in the Song of Solomon. My wife did a beautiful job of talking to the ladies, I to the men, and then sometimes we would talk together to everybody. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, and we saw the Word of God change thousands of marriages. And we still get emails back after all these years, because we haven't done it in several years, we still get emails back thanking us for teaching Song of Solomon. Solomon did that again when he was younger. At his prime, when he was king and expanding Israel spectacularly, both monetarily, culturally, economically, every way, he wrote the Proverbs. Now, he didn't write all of the 31 chapters of Proverbs, but he wrote most of them. And he spectacularly laid out wisdom and insight, and it was just a wonderful thing. Now, again, we have taught the Proverbs many times through the years, not in a conference setting, but mostly in a church setting. Later in Solomon's life, as he aged, he wrote Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes is one of the deepest books. Certainly the Apostle Paul would rival this in his writings. I mean, rival it and exceed it. But Ecclesiastes has a huge depth coming out of the many years of his life. And now, we always hear about Solomon and his many wives and all his shortcomings, but as you read Ecclesiastes, you can hear the pain coming out of his life, and you can hear the difficulties that he encountered and how those difficulties enhanced his writing and really kind of wrote the words for him. Now today, we're going to jump right in the middle of Ecclesiastes, and I'd like to just do this seventh chapter. Now, we undoubtedly won't get through the whole chapter in one day, but I'd like to open it and read some verses from Ecclesiastes. Now, if you have heard me speak, you know that I usually do the New American Standard Version. I often do that. I like that. I also like the New King James. But the English Standard Version has come out more recently and is quite, quite good. I mean, it's really something. And I've been very happy with passages. Now, I'm not leaving the New American Standard behind. I'm certainly going to continue to use that. But sometimes I want to use this version that we'll be hearing from today. Now, what I'd like to do is read a verse. I'll put it on the screen so you don't need to be always looking at your Bible, although it's fine if you want to. But I'll, I'll put it on the screen, and we'll use the English Standard Version on the screen, verse at a time. So we'll do a verse, read it, and then talk about it just for a moment. Okay, you with me? Okay, here we go. This again is Ecclesiastes 7, and I've titled this, although many commentators have also titled this chapter this, Wisdom Contrasted with Folly. So wisdom and folly are the two that we're talking about here. Here's the first verse. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of 
birth. Now you can see already this guy has really got some depth of what he's talking about. He talks about some really incredible things. A good name is better. Now when it says precious ointment, this is what was applied to the head. It was applied for both perfume, but it was all, or if you will, some cologne if you're a guy. But it, but it was also applied for healing this ointment. A good name is the most important thing you have. Your name, what's your name? Your name is more important. What people look at you, what they think of you when they hear your name is more important than your house. And we see people driving these incredible cars. You see the Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all this stuff. A good name is beyond any ointment, beyond any money, beyond anything you could possibly have. You say, well, I've got, you know, a good job. But a good name, what people say about you, what they're thinking about you, is more important than any ointment. Now look at this phrase. It says the day of death is better, is what is being said here, than the day of birth. Now we think, oh, a baby, and we celebrate a new baby. Whereas we think, oh, a funeral, that's a disaster, that's the end of life. But that's not what Scripture says. Your day of death, your day of passing, when you finally go through the valley, is the best day of your life if you know Christ. You go right into heaven, right into the presence. That's a good thing, right? That's a real good thing. There's also the aspect that when you're born, you've done nothing. When you die, you have lived a life, and hopefully a righteous life, maybe not a perfect life, but a life that's counted for something. You're getting this, right? And so your day of death is better than when you had done nothing when you were one hour old, when you were just born, because now you're both going into glory. This is obviously talking to believers. And you have accomplishments of things you've done. You've loved somebody, right? You've cared about somebody. You've done something with this life. And it does count. It really does count how you live your life. It matters. <laughs> Let's look at this second verse. A little long verse, but a wonderful verse again. It is better. Listen to the depth of Solomon now. It, this is incredible. Oh, do I love this guy. Sorry, I know he had a lot of wives, but he sure had wisdom. It is better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. Can hardly say enough about this. You got sorrow in your heart. You got trouble. You got problems around you. I do. It is better that you're soft before God than that you're cocky before God. Better to be in a place of mourning than a place of pounding down the beers or pounding down whatever joy you might get out of a video game or whatever joy you might get out of sex or I don't want to you know get too out there but I mean nothing compares to the softness of walking with God I think one of the times when I'm closest to the Lord is when I'm smashed <laughs> So I get close to him pretty often because <laughs> I'm getting smashed by life and by things pretty often, mostly by my own mistakes. But, but we need to be understanding there's a sense where the house of mourning is not a bad thing. Now, this is not taught in most of our churches. Are you aware of this? Not in very few. <laughs> but that's the end of all mankind. People need to number their days and count their life. You're going to pass. Newsflash, teenager. <laughs> you think because you're bubbling with power right now that you're going to go forever and ever and ever. But that's not accurate. Each of us will pass through the valley of the shadow of death unless we're 
translated and the Lord takes you home, that's wonderful too. But to count our days and number them, the living will lay it to heart, not just to mind, but to heart. Number three, and this goes right along with this, Solomon says, sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. Think of the depth of this phrase. I mean, ah, Solomon understood that sorrow is better than laughter. Now, this is completely contrary to the world culture. The world culture, everything says, have fun, live it up, now is your best life, right? I mean, did I quote a book? Anyway, this is all right there in the culture where they're pushing this concept of live it up, the good life. But we as the true believers, and there are a few of us, we as the true believers understand that sorrow is better than laughter, and by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. So you got your face that may be expressing sobriety, but deep in your heart, you understand they're the things of eternity and the things of Christ and tomorrow that you treasure close. Fourth verse. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. In other words, choose your house. You can't be in both places. You've got to choose. I will choose the house of God with all its troubles and with all its rejection that the world gives me. I will choose the house of God rather than the house of fools because I have an understanding that there is a God and there is an eternity and there is a tomorrow and there is a final reckoning. Verse 5, it is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the songs, the song of fools. I was tempted here to put up on the screen or at least quote a number of popular songs and what they're saying. I resisted the temptation. But I sure thought about doing it because the stuff that's being blasted on the radio and blasted out there on CDs and blasted into the earphones, right? A lot of that stuff is trash and lies and deception. So we're not listening to the song of fools, but rather the rebuke of the wise man. Now, nobody wants to be rebuked, but we need exhortation, don't we? We need to be challenged. We need to be called higher than ourself. Yes? You actually need to be called up. And the way you're going to be called up is by wisdom and by wise men. Number six. Again, we're running through these verses. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools, this also is vanity. Crackling of thorns under the pot. What does this imply? It implies hell. It sure does. There is a hell to shun. My father would always say this, and he spoke to hundreds of millions through his radio broadcast. Not he himself, but the broadcast. But he would always say there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. A hell to shun, a heaven to gain. Say it with me. A hell to shun, a heaven to gain. Absolutely. Foolishness will lead to the house of the fools. Verse 7, surely oppression drives the wise into madness. I tell you, this guy is something. (laughs) And a bribe corrupts the heart, or the literal Hebrew there is destroys the heart. A bribe destroys the heart. When oppression comes, the wise, the righteous, 
are upset by it. We don't rejoice when there's horror and sadness. Look at what's happened in Grand Bahama Island. Look at what's happened in Treasure Cay. I mean, that what happened with Dorian and that whole thing that has devastated the Bahamas recently. They say you can't get off the plane or come anywhere near certain areas because huge areas just reek with the dead still in the rubble. It's just unbelievable. But that brings us pain that we don't say, oh, I'm so glad it wasn't me. I'm so glad I wasn't there. That isn't our first thought as the righteous, right? Our first thought is compassion for them and for the thousands, obviously, that have lost their lives. Oppression drives the wise into madness. In other words, we really do weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Verse 8, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. What's better when they first clear a baseball diamond or when the first pitch is finally done, right? What's better when you first lay the stone of a university or when it's finished? I mean, or the house of God when it's first started or when you actually have a building? I mean, I can go on and on, not just with physical things, but what's better, to graduate kindergarten or to graduate sixth grade, right? Or a college <laughs> or your master's or whatever. But I mean, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Now, how does this apply to us as believers? It applies specifically to our walk with God. We hear so much, are you born again? Everybody talks about, are you born again? But there's another question, are you maturing in Christ? <laughs> are you growing in the Lord, right? I mean, we're always counting the numbers of how many are born again, and that's an important number, I understand that. But what about the maturation of the saints? What about growing up in Christ? Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Which are we? Patient or proud? Proud or patient? Now, patient means don't give up, don't give out, don't give in, right? Hang in there. I mean, this is not really very complicated, actually. But hang in there. Be patient in spirit. Patient on God. That is a hard thing for us as believers to be patient with God. Now, he sure is patient with us. But for us to be patient with him, Lord, I know you're going to take care of this. I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to get me through. I know this is going to turn. Now, patience, I believe, of course, is wrapped around hope and hope around patience, but nevertheless, Ecclesiastes, the preacher he's called, the writer here, is really attacking pride. You look at world leaders, all of them, most of them I probably should say, and there's an oozing of pride, but you would think they would see that the world leaders in the first century are no longer here. <laughs> Life goes on and passes. Verse 9, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Boy, you can feel this anger sometimes getting stored up, and you really need to deal with it. Anger can build up in us, and we can hold this resentment and that resentment. Many of them are not accurate or even valid, but we can let them build up, and all of a sudden somebody comes along and flips a match, and the fuse is lit, and boom, it goes off. But it says, anger lodges in the heart of fools. Now, that doesn't mean that you're finally a fool if you've ever been angry, but remember that you want to get away from the anger, you want to retreat from it, but probably more important than that 
is to deal with the roots of anger as they look to build in your life. All right, verse 10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? Unquote. For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Oh, is this ever a saying from Ecclesiastes? Don't we always do this? I mean, at least I do. Oh, I remember the good old days. and Life was so much easier. This is when I was able to really have fun. And now look at all the issues and the problems. Why is this? Why can't it be like it always was? Why can't it be like it was when my kids were young or when we had it just really simple? And now life is so complicated. Stop, is what Scripture is saying. Live right where he has you right now. Don't always be looking over your shoulder, looking back, looking back. God's got a place for you now. Now. This is fresh. This moment. Yes, you're listening to this, right? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Now, when it says ask this, that implies somebody's listening, right? That you're asking it of someone. You're asking of God is what's going on. You're asking God, why can't this be like it used to be? You're asking him, and here the caution comes from the preacher, which is what Solomon called himself. And so do I for today, at least. Verse 11, wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. Now, this is not talking about those that have left an inheritance. This is talking about those that have one now, those that see the sun. So this is talking about the living, right? This is pretty obvious stuff. Talking about the living. Wisdom is good with an inheritance. In other words, this whole thing of sell whatever you have and go up in a tree and wait to get raptured. You know, I mean, don't do that. We as the people of God need to be accumulating Godly wealth doesn't mean we don't tithe, doesn't mean we don't give offerings, doesn't mean we don't honor the Lord, but we need to be accumulating what God has blessed us with and realize that there's inheritance that's good, but it must be, must be coupled with wisdom. Verse 12, and here he gets into it even more. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge or wisdom, the advantage, it could be translated either direction, by the way, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. You see these billionaires, you see these wealthy people, but without wisdom, it doesn't mean anything. (laughs) Money has a way of getting wings and flying away. There was a guy recently that hung himself in prison. You probably know this story. He had lots and lots of money, but no integrity, no righteousness, and certainly no wisdom. So protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. Knowledge preserves both. Verse 13, consider the work of God, who can make straight that he has made crooked. What a phrase. Some of this stuff we don't get very often, and it's in the Bible, and we need to look at this. We always think, well, God is good. He makes everything perfect. He makes everything a blessing. But that's not what's being said here at all. Consider the work of God who can make straight what he has made crooked. Let's face it. There's some things you just can't change. Right? You're just not going to be able, no matter how much you want them to change, no matter how much you are determined to change somebody's head, right? If I could just get into that head and switch it around. (laughs) <laughs> right? And I'll just get in that head and straighten it out. But God has made 
some things crooked. That doesn't give us any, any excuse for being sinful. That's not what's being said. But it means that we as the believers need to understand that sometimes things will enter our life. Sometimes people will enter our life for our maturation and for our ultimate good and for our to being formed, for us to be formed closer to the image of Christ. Enough Solomon's Ecclesiastes for today. These 13 verses are packed with insight, packed with wisdom. I'm just expounding on what's already there. Let's open our hands. Ah, oh, I want prayer. Do you want prayer? I want prayer. You know what I'm going to pray for, right? Oh, you know what I'm going to pray for. Sure, I'm going to pray for wisdom. Here we go. If you got your hands open, we're going to be asking for this. Here we go. Lord, bless us with wisdom. Lord, we don't ask for money. We don't ask for power. We don't ask for prestige. We ask for the wisdom of God. Lord, bless every hand that's open and heavenward, that these hands and these hearts would be full of the insight and wisdom and blessing of Christ. It's in his name and for his sake alone. We pray now. Amen. Lord bless you. Be wise as Christ was wise.